What offices doth Christ execute as our Redeemer? Christ as our Redeemer executeth the offices of a prophet, of a priest, and of a king, both in his estate of humiliation and exaltation. So we've seen that the Redeemer of God's elect is the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we've seen that to understand Christ, we know that he's one person and that he has two uh, natures. Uh, we see that the way in which that came about was through his incarnation, the eternal uh, second person of the Trinity in time um, took to himself uh, a, a true body and a reasonable soul. And all of this is in pursuit of the salvation of his people in order that everyone would not perish in the estate of sin and misery, that God's elect would in fact be saved in the end. The catechism is now going to go on over the next few questions and break this down further. So we've gone from, re from a redeemer who's going to rescue people from perishing to understanding that he was incarnate, that part of the way in which he redeemed his people was through uh, coming into this world as the, as the Savior. In the next few questions, it's going to break down the three offices that belong to Christ and how they relate to our salvation and the two states that belong to Christ, his, his humiliation and his exaltation as the Redeemer, as the incarnate Word. So three offices and then two states and all of these are being tied together. So here in question 23, it begins with the offices and says, okay, Christ comes and is incarnate, comes into this world uh, as the Redeemer. What offices does he execute as our Redeemer? Now remember what we, we heard in a, f a few classes ago that Christ, the word Christ means Messiah. And both the word Christ and Messiah refer to the anointed one. So the one who's anointed. Here, when we think of Christ, we can think of the mediator. He is a suitable mediator. Uh, one who stands between God and man. One who serves to connect, if you will, God and man. He's the mediator. Christ is working as a mediator on behalf of his people. And the question is, if he's the anointed one who's the mediator, um, who exactly was anointed? So in the Old Testament, who is it that was anointed uh, in various offices? And there are three, which is why our catechism, following closely the Bible, outlines for us in the next few questions these three offices. Now when we say office, children, some of you think of, well, my dad goes to his office. You think of a room you know, that has a computer and a desk and drawers and, and so on and so forth. But that's not what's being referred to. It's not referring to a place. It's referring to a person or a position, if you will, a position that someone occupies. So it's a position of authority. An office is a position of authority that is assigned uh, certain duties or per certain uh, service that, that uh, they are to perform on behalf of another. So an office is in a place, it's a position, and it's a position that comes with authority that, that is assigned to carry out certain duties uh, on behalf of another person. Um, those three offices, which we'll be looking at, are prophet, priest, and king. Three positions that had respective, distinct responsibilities to perform on behalf of others. When you turn to the New Testament, we have offices as well. So in the New Testament, Christ establishes uh, a government for his church, and he specifically appoints uh, the components or parts of that church government. And it's connected to the Old Testament. There is a measure of continuum there, but it's also different. So as you think of the New Testament, there are three offices of three primary offices within the, the church. You have ministers, and they're, a, they're given uh, authority to carry out certain responsibilities, the preaching of the word and the sacraments, as, as well as teaching and shepherding the people. Then you have the office of elder, which is a, a separate office. 
and they're given the responsibility of ruling and overseeing and shepherding the flock together with the, the pastor and caring for the souls. Then you have the office of deacon, and it too is a distinct office, and it has a separate set of responsibilities in terms of addressing the uh, tangible needs of the church and of the community and in dealing with works of mercy and in caring for the physical and financial uh, provisions of, of the people. So here we're referring to three Old Testament offices that pointed forward to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Three offices which will come back, each, each of these will be given a separate catechism question. The first is, so this is the overview in this class, the first is the Old Testament office of, of prophet which pointed forward to the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the Old Testament office of prophet, a prophet was not just a person who predicted the future. A prophet is one who came from God to men with a word. They came with a message. They were primarily preachers. They were, they were preaching and teaching God's law and teaching the revealed will of God to his people. That was their task. They, they received from God a message and they brought that message to God's people. In some cases, it did talk about the future but in many other cases it didn't talk about the future. The second Old Testament office that points to Christ is the office of priest. And you can think of it, this is somewhat simple, but I'm, I'm aiming at simplicity. You can think of it as uh, going the other direction. The priest starts with man, as it were, and then goes to God on man's behalf. The priest is serving with authority to represent the people before the Lord. And so the priest would come to the people and on behalf of the people would offer sacrifices up to God for uh, the atonement of the sins of his people. Those sacrifices themselves pointed to the Lord Jesus Christ, right? But these were the means that God appointed for people to exercise faith through in looking to, to the Lord. They would also... They would also pray on behalf of the people. They would pray for the people, standing before God, interceding uh, for them, and so on. The third office is the office of king. Prophet, priest, and king. And this too is an Old Testament office that uh, pointed forward to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the king, most of you know what a, a, a king is. A king is one who rules or protects uh, the people and serves in that, that capacity. And so God would have the king. So in the Old Testament, uh, you had prophets. We have whole books of the Bible, right? The prophet Isaiah, the prophet Jeremiah, the prophet Daniel, and all the minor prophets like Hosea and Micah and Amos, and Jonah, and so on. Moses was also a prophet, and he served in this capacity. Then we have priests. The first one you think of is Aaron and his, his sons as well. They were the high priests. But then there was a whole office of priests in addition to the high priest. And they carried out these functions, all of the work of uh, the sacrifices and the, the, the worship of the temple and interceding. And then you had Old Testament kings, right? You think of of King Saul, the first one. But more, more importantly, we think of people like King David, who was a king that pointed forward to Christ. He was a, a picture of who Christ would be, or King Solomon and others, right? These are Old Testament examples of, uh, of these prophets, of these offices. And what I want to highlight here is the way in which these offices, which Christ steps into, Christ takes these offices He's going to execute, bring about the salvation of his people through these offices. I want you to see how they correspond to us, right? The prophet addresses our ignorance. We are an ignorant people. And they, they come, uh, uh, the prophet comes to teach and instruct us in the truth of God. The priest addresses our guilt, which we've discussed previously. We are guilty. They came 
the, prof, the, the, the priest comes to offer sacrifices and intercede on behalf of, of a uh, sinful people. And then the king comes to us in our bondage. We are in bondage to sin. Christ comes to set us free. He comes to conquer his and our enemies. He comes to deliver us from the domination of the devil and to bring us under his peaceable reign of, of liberty. And so it addresses our, our bondage. And notice that the Catechism says that Christ executes these offices in the two states that I mentioned at the beginning, both in humiliation and exaltation. So all three of these can be seen in both Christ's state of humiliation, which gets a whole catechism question, and in his state of exaltation, which gets a separate catechism question, and what follows. So all three of these pour into these two uh, states that Christ finds himself in, uh, that he is brought into. So you can, um, you can remember the idea of state. We talked, about, we talked about man's free will in the estate of innocency, in the estate of sin after the fall, in the state of grace after salvation, in the state of heaven, right? Those are all states. Well, that's what we're referring to here, these states of humiliation, and uh, we're using the word in the same way, exaltation. So an estate is... Um, a condition, if you will. It is a stage or a status. So I think last time we were talking about this, I said, before you get married, you're in a state, you're in an estate of singleness. And then the wedding day comes and you take your vows and you're married. Now you're in a different state in life. You're, you're in the estate of marriage. You're in a different condition. You're in a different status, different stage of, of, of life. So Christ comes to, to execute these three offices in these two estates, and he does so within uh, the context of the covenant of grace. So all of this is accomplished. Christ becomes our prophet, our priest, and our king in, in his humiliation, in his exaltation for us. So all of this that Christ is doing is for us. Salvation is ultimately us trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, trusting in Christ as our prophet, as our priest, as our king, trusting in Christ in the execution of those offices throughout his humiliation, trusting in Christ in the execution of those offices throughout his exaltation as well. So this is describing who Christ is and what Christ has done. And that is, in summary, our salvation. And that is why we are looking to Christ as our Redeemer, as our Savior, as the one who is able to bring to pass the deliverance from sin and misery into fellowship with God and the forgiveness of sins. So this, this question, which is in some ways a preface to what follows in the next several questions, the next five or six questions, uh, says this, what offices doth Christ execute as our Redeemer? Christ as our Redeemer executeth the offices of a prophet, of a priest, and of a king, both in his estate of humiliation and exaltation.